introduce our amazing speaker for today, which is Gabriela de Queiroz. She'll be talking about data science as a team sport. And Gabriela is originally from Brazil, where she completed her undergrad in statistics at the State University of Rio, Rio de Janeiro, and uh, her master in epidemiology from the Fundação Fiocruz. So during her, that time, she researched um, how air pollution affects uh, pe people's health. After that, she then moved to California to complete uh, yet another master, uh, now in statistics in California State East Bay. And she's currently the engineering and data science master at IBM, where she managed and leads a team of develop developers working in data and AI open source projects. So through her career, she uh, has focused on increased diversity in programming, and especially in R, with the, exam the amazing exp example that she creates uh, R Ladies. She's the founder of the R Ladies. And she uh, was the first Latin and the sixth woman globally to be elected uh, as a member of the R Foundation. So we are so excited to have you here today, Gabriela. And we want once again to thank you for accepting our invitation and also for creating our ladies. So the stage is yours. Awesome. So hello, everyone. My name is Gabrielle de Quiroz. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I have a presentation, but I also would like for us to have a conversation. Like, so if you have any question, anything that you want to ask me, uh, you can put on the chat. I'll see if there is any question related to what I'm talking about. I'll try to answer right away, or if not, I'll answer in the end. Um, so let me start sharing my screen. And let's do... Um, I only... Oh, uh, okay, so this is what I need. All right, so... If you want to get the slides that I'm going to show today, um, there is a bit.ly URL over here in the very bottom. Uh, also my Twitter, uh, this link tree that there is a lot of, a lot of uh, links over here. And, and today the, the goal of this talk actually is kind of like to share uh, some of like the, the roles that you can take as a data scientist because data science is such a, you know, a, a a broad term and depending on the company that you work for you're going to be doing a totally different role and i want to share like how the roles can be different based on my uh, personal experience so other than uh, being a machine learning manager at ibm and founder of our ladies i'm a founder of ai inclusive which i created uh, last year uh, also member of our foundation. Um, so I, I don't like to label myself with just one thing. Uh, actually, I don't like to label, but like, so like in the bottom, you can see like all the, the ways that I, or how I consider myself. So I consider myself, even though I'm a manager, but I also consider myself a data scientist, a developer advocate. So I, I really enjoy talking and, and sharing my knowledge, open source developer. Um, a statistician, because that's my, my background, epidemiologist, my background as well, uh, community builder, one of my passions, uh, a mentor, another passion, a speaker, and I educator. So our ladies, and I don't have a bunch of, I, I only have two slides on our ladies, unfortunately, uh, but I can talk a little bit about our ladies and how it all came together. So as Daniela was saying, I'm from Brazil. So I'm from Rio de Janeiro, uh, which is a city in South America in Brazil, and we speak Portuguese, we don't speak Spanish. Uh, so uh, then I, I came to the US in 2012 to do a second master's. And one thing that I, that I noticed, uh, let, me, let me even go back. One thing that I, um, that I did when I got here, I was so impressed uh, with so many resources that we have available in the U.S., especially in California, San Francisco, the hub of technology. So I found out that there was this thing called uh, meetup.com, right, the website. So once I found out about this meetup.com thing, I, I started signing up for 
all different groups uh, and a lot of like terminology of the group things I was not aware of. So I joined groups like data visualization and a fun fact, that was the first time ever that I saw a talk by Hadley Wickham. And I just remember being so nervous. I don't, I don't remember, I don't think he knows that, but I, I was so nervous because he was, he still is, like kind of like a rock star, you know, like the person and I'm like, oh my God, this person that I, you know, that created this and this and this, he's here giving this talk and I'm here in San Francisco. It was kind of like a dream, dream come true, the dream come true. Um, so anyway, so I, I joined data visualization group, uh, uh, Hadoop, SQL, uh, machine learning, a lot of things that I had no idea, but as I was trying to understand the tech world, I knew that those were things that I needed to know. Uh, so, you know, as a student coming from South America, um, the dollar is very expensive for us, so I didn't have much money. So I had enough money to pay the basic and going to the meetups was the best of the worlds because I was learning for free and also they were offering dinner for free. So I would go every night to, every night I would go to a different meetup. So I would learn for free and eat for free. Um, so after a while, I, I, I got to a point where I'm like, okay, this is cool, right? So I'm learning all that for free. Uh, you know, people are here uh, dedicating their time to come and share the knowledge. So, uh, I think it's my time to give back to the community, right? So it's a cycle. So you receive and you should also give back. So the cycle continues. And, and then I was thinking, okay, what can I do? Or what do I know that I can share with others? And I was using R um, back in Brazil uh, when I was doing research. And I was like, why not R, right? I, I love R, it's, it's my passion. And why don't I, why don't I create a group uh, focusing on ER? Uh, but I didn't want to have like a general R group because one thing that I realized in going to these meetups is that the, the, the audience was not uh, diverse at all, right? So it was very white male dominant and me as a woman and as a foreign, I would be in the corner, uh, not interacting much, not asking question. And, and then I was like, why don't, I create something that is going to be welcome to everybody where I could feel included, where I could see myself, where people could come and feel safe and welcome. So then that was the idea behind our ladies. Uh, so that was October 2012 uh, was the first meetup, the first event ever, which is this uh, screenshot over here. Um, and it was an introduction to R, uh, which I have no idea why, like how, like I, I don't remember like uh, how courageous I was to be in front of people talking English and, and teaching R. I don't, I don't remember like how come, because I, I you know, I, I was not a very, um, like let's say extrovert person. I was more on the shy side, but I was doing this. I don't know how come, but anyway, but I did it. Uh, and then one fun fact, because we were talking about fun fact. So this meetup, I was very excited. And then in the end, when it was time to the meetup to start, only eight people showed up. So I was very disappointed. And I was like, Phew. I'm here to teach R, R is awesome. Uh, Google is hosting us. We have this beautiful dinner. You know, this office is off, awesome. Uh, and only eight people showed up. So then in the end, someone came to me and said, Gabriela, let me talk to you for a second. Do you know why not a lot of people showed up? And I'm like, why? Because today is Halloween. And Halloween is a tradition in the, is a tradition tradition in the US, so people go outside and party. And especially in San Francisco, people are there in the, in the Castro playing and partying. And you should, you should feel lucky that we have eight people here. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, first lesson learned. 
I will never again schedule anything on a Halloween night. And in Brazil, we don't have this tradition, so we don't have Halloween or we don't celebrate or whatever. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, my, my numbers here are out of date, but um, Our Ladies is now pretty much all over the world. Um, and last year, um, I was working, you know, I've been working with artificial intelligence for a while. And I was seeing a lot of discussion around facial recognition, uh, all the discrimination, uh, um, uh, all the, the, the implications that the algorithm were um, causing on people's life, right? So I was seeing all this discussion and people being affected, people going to prison, uh, so many bad things happening because of AI. And I saw the discussion happening mainly in the US and China, right? So, and I was seeing this, you know, exploding, like this is going to affect people all over the world and I need to do something around this. And I'm like, okay, so how can I do something? Uh, I was feeling impatient that I, I couldn't be seated still watching all the news around me and not doing anything, right? So, I said, why don't I create another organization? Since it's something that I'm passionate about, which is community. Why don't I create another organization where I'm going to try to change this? I'm going to try to have a better representation and a better participation of minority groups in AI, right? Because again, if you think about data science not being a tech in general, not being a diverse area, if you go to a more specific AI area, it's not diverse at all, it's even worse. So that's how AI inclusive was created. Um, so our main mission is to increase the representation and participation of minority groups in AI with a focus in, 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 in gender. Um, so we are building this community to make AR more inclusive to everyone. The, the kind of like the way that it, it works is very similar to Our Lady since Our Lady was so successful and changed um, so many lives. Um, I, I wanted to do something very similar. So we had our launch, launch event in December last year. So it's been a year and we have uh, four chapters, one in San Francisco and three, sorry, two in Brazil. One is Rio de Janeiro and the other one in Salvador. So we have three chapters in total and we've been hosting events and talks and tutorials. And, and also like we have a lot of like interesting stuff like resources on AI, data science, machine learning, uh, events uh, for free, right? Free tickets for conferences and a lot of other things. So we try to, we are trying to, to do two things. So the first thing is to bring awareness around algorithms, AI implication, because people, especially in, in some um, areas, they are not familiar with AI. They have no idea that AI is all over the place and AI is with you in your house, in your phone. Like they think that AI is something very futuristic, that it's like, uh, it's, they think, when, when you, we talk about AI, they think about uh, robots, right? They don't see AI as, you know, something that it's around you all the time. Camera is filming you. Um, so we bring awareness about uh, issues that AI can cause or the algorithms. And then the second piece is around education and empowering those community to get into tech, to get to, into AI. Um, one thing that we just announced uh, two days ago, I guess, on Tuesday, is uh, a partnership with DataQuest. So we launched a scholarship program. And if you don't know, DataQuest is a data science online platform. Um, so we are offering for this round 350 scholarships. So in that platform, they offer several courses, uh, including data science in R, data science in Python, data engineering. So that you have paths and you have also courses. Like let's say you wanna learn data visualization with R. They have a course on that. Oh, you wanna learn, I don't know, uh, machine learning in Python. 
they also have a course. Um, so the first round, we are going to have a few rounds of scholarships. So this first round that opened two days ago, uh, it's focused on women and underrepresented genders. And you have until next week to apply. So it's a very short window uh, to apply. But I would check, I would say, you know, suggest you to take a look because it's a, it's a great opportunity. The platform is great. Um, and, and yeah, so that's all. So, okay, so the organizations, so I always like to start with the organizations when I talk about myself because it's such a huge part of who I am and what I do. And, um, but I want to talk about the data science career and I wanna show you kind of like my, my career path, even though I'm showing here as a straight line, my career path is not a straight line at all, but this is, this is something for another time, another talk. Uh, let's suppose that my career is this beautiful straight line uh, where, you know, I finished my bachelor degree in statistics. I was a statistician, so working in academia for several years. Uh, and, then, um, and then when I moved to the U.S., um, I, I was a TA for, for, for a semester. Uh, and that was a cool position because that one, even though I was inside a design department, I was teaching the students how to use R. Uh, so how to get the data through R, how to manipulate data using R, and then they would do some kind of like plotting and they would export to Photoshop or Illustrator so they could do infographics. So it was a cool experience. And then I worked uh, in, in different companies like startups uh, to uh, moving to IBM, which I moved in 2018. Okay. So let's talk about the data science career, right? So when we talk about the data science career, I, I really like this, this, this charge over here where you, know, you have what my boss think data science is. So it's like a money printer where we are just like making money for the company. And then you have what my customers think data science is. They think we are uh, uh, magic, how do you say, uh, like we're doing magic. And you know we do something, and then we have an answer. And then, like engineers, they think that we have this box where we—it's like we put together math, stats, machine learning, and then you have an answer, right? But in reality, data science is much more than that. It's like it's kind of like a, 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 a or, orchestra, right? You have you you should have some knowledge in statistics, maybe a little bit in infrastructure. You need to know. A software, uh, you need to know data sources. So it's a collection of skills and things. And the other thing is like, usually you are not, you are not the only one, you have a team uh, working with you, right? So in my opinion, data scientists are very adaptable and flexible professionals. And I think in the next few slides, you are going to see why data scientists are very adaptable and flexible. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned this in the very beginning, but as you work for a company, your role is probably going to be different from the role that I have at IBM, probably going to be different from a, another person working in academia and different from another person working for a different company. So the data science, they can have different roles in different companies. So let me show you some examples. So when I moved from academia, academia, to industry, the first company that I worked for, it was called Alpine Data. So Alpine Data, what they had was this platform, so this software, where you didn't have to code to analyze the data. So they had kind of like this canvas where you were combining operators, so you would combine an operator to get the data, and then uh, you get the data, you do some manipulation, and then you are going to split your data into train and pass, and then you are going to do some kind of like logistic regression, and then maybe you are going to do the ROC. So you are combining different operators and you are not coding. There are some like tweaks that you could do, um, but, but in, in uh, the main or the mission of the company was to make uh, data science available to everyone. So 
uh, led, led to post me as a business person. I didn't know how to code, but I know exactly what I want to do, right? So I could use this software, for example. So uh, the company was small, so there were 40 employees, and we had 10 engineers and five data scientists. And I like, I, I like to share the numbers because you are going to see the ratio between employees, engineers, and data scientists, because this can vary a lot. Uh, what was the responsibility for the data scientists in this company? Very different or very different from other companies. But the first one, so uh, let me give you an example. So like, let's suppose uh, Daniela worked for a company and they don't have a data scientist house. So they are going to buy my software and they are going to hire me as a data scientist to work on their project. So I was doing some kind of like consultancy, right? So they would hire me to work in a particular project using my software. Okay, the second, the second responsibility was write documentation. So we were a software company, so we needed documentation to go along with the software. So me as a data scientist, I would write documentation more specifically around how to use the software to do statistics, for example, or like how to run logistic regression. So I, I would say, you know, a little summary around what logistic regression is and how to use logistic regression within our software. So documentation. Third piece, train the customers. So I would go to the company or do webinars and show how to use our software. It's kind of like a salesperson, but I was not selling, I was showing, right? Some, 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 sometimes I would do like a POC, for example, or I would show, yeah, so I would train them. Uh, and then the fourth thing is prioritization. What means that because I was working with the customers, the customer would come to me and say, Gabriella, you know, I was looking for this feature in the software and you don't have this feature yet. Can you, can you and your team prioritize this feature in the next release? So I would come and bring this feedback to the team, to my team, to our, um, to the engineers and data scientists and products say, oh, the customer X is asking for this feature. The customer Y is asking for this feature. So some kind of like prioritization. And another fact, uh, if you look at the tools, I'm, I'm showing you tools that are not uh, the traditional data science tools. So one is Spark, the other one is Scala, and the other one is Pig and Hive. So those are languages used by the engineers. Me as a data scientist, I was pretty much not coding at all because I was using the software and the whole idea of the software was to make data science more accessible so you didn't, you, you didn't need to code. So, but I was a data scientist, but I was not coding. <laughs> so, I, you know, that was a very interesting role that gave me, um, you know, some skills uh, that I didn't have before, even though I was, I was not coding for the time that I was working for this company, I was able to develop other skills. Okay. Then it was time for me to move on, right? I was like, okay, I'm done. This, this company doesn't have a, a career path. They are very small. Uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. So maybe I should move on. So when I was thinking about moving on to a different company, one thing that I always think is the next company that I'm going to work for, it needs to be very different from the previous company, right? Because even the first, the, the, the first in the industry job, when I was looking for a job, I was like, oh, you know, maybe I should work with public health because I'm, I am an epidemiologist. I should work with air pollution. It's so comfortable to be there and to work with the things that I know. And I'm like, no, I want to do something totally different because I want to learn more and more and more. Right, let me get out of my comfort zone. Um, so when I was looking for my next job, I was like, okay, I wanna do something different and I wanna do something that I'm interested in learning. And one particular area that fascinated me was the, the advertising, the online advertising uh, space. 
not that I like advertisements, not that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pro anyway. So, but I, I'm fascinated about, uh, about how things work, right? Because like, if I open my cell phone right now, the ad that is going to show now, it's going to be different, probably different from the ad that it's going to show the next second as I refresh the page, right? So for, for, for you, it's going to be showing a specific ad for me is going to be showing a different ad. So I was like, how is that possible, right? Um, so I wanna learn more about uh, advertising. So when I joined my, my, my next company, that's the company that I, that I, that I was looking for. So I, I joined Shareto, which they were a native advertising company. So native advertising or native advertisement means that it's kind of like Twitter, Facebook, where you have feed, 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 ad, feed, 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 ad. And the ad is, so is in between feeds, so it's embedded and they have a similar look and feel as the page, right? Whereas before, uh, you know, like, especially in the early ages of internet, the ads, they were very annoying, popping up in your screen where you could not see anything other than ads. Uh, the more like, let's say, uh, modern advertising, uh, advertisers, uh, they use the native one where they are in bab, they have the same look and feel, uh, they can be like a regular ad or they can be an article sponsored by a company, right? So, so I joined this company. So let me talk about some interesting things about this company. Um, when I joined, I was so happy and excited because they told me that they, they were collecting petabytes and petabytes of data every day. So I'm like, okay, cool. This is going to be like, uh, you know, like a playground. I'm going to do a lot of cool analysis. I'm going to provide a lot of good data, uh, insights. Uh, I'm going to run models and this is going to be awesome. Okay, so then I joined the company. So let's go through the numbers. The company, uh, they had 150, so 150 employees, right? So they were bigger, like three times bigger, almost four times bigger than the previous company. They had 20 engineers, but then they only had one data scientist, which was myself. Phew, yes, that was tough. So I joined the company. When I joined the company, I was like, okay, give me the data. I wanna play with this data. And then the engineers were like, oh, the data is stored in this place over here. And I'm like, how can I access the data? And they were like, oh, good luck. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay. I don't have, I don't have uh, anywhere to go or to run. I, sh I, I need to do something. I need to find out what I'm going to do. So I was able to work with engineers for six months on creating the data pipeline. So they, 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 they worked with me to create this data pipeline so I could use the data. So it took six months, six months. I was not doing much other than thinking about how we are going to create this data pipeline, uh, thinking about the type of data that I needed and so on. So responsibilities. So first of all, infrastructure. And if you ask me, did you have any, um, did you have any previous knowledge on infrastructure? And I would say no. Luckily, they had engineers. Luckily, they had data engineers that, could, that helped me uh, through this journey because otherwise I, I don't know what I, what I would do. Uh, once we had the infrastructure in place, finally, I was able to create some models. And the first model that I created, the first of the seconds, I, I, maybe the second one was around optimization uh, was, you know, I, I couldn't find, it was a very interesting problem because I couldn't find uh, out of box model. So I had to think about um, all the, the possibilities, all the, the, the constraints. Uh, I, I had to know the business very well so I could create this optimiz optimization algorithm. Another thing that I did was, um, a-B test, but not the A-B test 
um, that we usually see, which is, you know, we have a red and green button, which button performs better? No, it was, I, ha I had two models, I guess, they had two models running in production, and I would, I would track them uh, and see which one, which one was performing better uh, in, in the production, right? So I was, it's kind of like an A-B testing, but it was with two models running in production. And then the fourth piece was around education. So why education? So I was the first data scientist, remember? So no one in the company, they never had a data scientist before. I was the, the first one ever hired for the company, right? So, uh, so they had no idea what the data scientist was and what kind of work the data scientist does. So I had first to educate them. This is how I work. This is how a data science workflow looks like. Uh, this is how long usually my work is going to take. Um, because one thing that was very, uh, was very annoying for me was we had the standups every day. Every day, you know, we would uh, stand up and then everyone would say what they did yesterday and what they are planning to do today, right? And then the engineers on my team, they would say, oh, yesterday, you know, we pushed this thing to production and today I'm going to fix this bug. And then it would go around and come to me and I say, oh yeah, yesterday I was exploring the data. Yeah, today I'm also exploring the data. <laughs> so it, it felt like, you know, I was not uh, progressing. Uh, so it took me a while to kind of get through my frustration and like, okay, my workflow is different. Uh, and then also like, I would go, oh, today I'm, 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 I'm working on this model. And then next day, oh, I'm still working on the model. And then 10 days after I would say, remember the model, it didn't work out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, it was a learning experience, I think for all of us. And the other piece around education, um, was the engineers didn't know uh, what I was doing. So I, I was um, careful, I, I tried to be careful enough to show them, to educate them around the things that I was doing so we could talk, right? So uh, we had like lunch and learns where we would, we would watch uh, data science lectures together. I would go to the whiteboard and show, you know, how to do things. Now, Okay, so what about the tools? So in that company I was programming. So I was doing programming, I was coding. So I was using R and Python and SQL. Uh, I was using, because they, everything was running Spark, I would do like uh, PySpark, uh, Scala, very little. Um, I was using RStudio, Databricks and Jupyter. Uh, one thing that I that I learned in this company when working with engineers was they would run everything in Scala, which I'm not familiar with, but uh, I made the effort to try to learn a little bit enough so we could talk, right? So I didn't have to learn how to program in Scala, but just like to know what they were doing. So I would I would not be bothering them all the time with my questions around their code. So I was able at least to, to understand what they were doing as a high level. That's, that was what I needed, not, not to go into very details. Okay, then time to move on. Next, next company. Uh, um, so then the same thing, when I was looking for the next company, I was like, okay, what I wanna do now, I wanna do something that is different, something that it's interesting to me, something that I've never done before. So I've never worked for a financial company or a bank or, or in the financial industry. So there was this opportunity to work for this credit card company called Deserve, where during that time, their main business was around uh, international students. So as an international student that come to the US, we come in a visa uh, where we don't have social security, for example, so we cannot have a credit card, we cannot build a credit history, then we cannot, it's very hard to rent houses, it's very hard to 
buy a car and so on. So what this company did was based on a lot of signals, uh, they, had, they would give the international students a credit card with a, a high limit and you would be able to start building your history, right? So, because usually it's like, oh, I'm a student for three years, I don't have credit history, but then once I'm on, on my OPT, I can work, I can have a credit card, and then I can start my uh, credit history life, right? But then you, you lost like three years that you've been in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the country. So anyway, so, uh, so the main goal for the company was to uh, make credit card available to international students. So let's go through the company numbers again. So this number, this company, they had 35 employees seven engineers and four data scientists. Pretty good if you compare it to other companies. Uh, okay, let me drink some tea so I can keep going. Okay, responsibilities. Again, creating the infrastructure. So we had data coming from third, third parties. And in the beginning, the data would come through email, through links, through so many different places in different formats. So the first thing was to think about the infrastructure. How are we going to get this data? How are we going to store this data? Where are we going to store the data? Once we have the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure, the second thing that we did was to create dashboards. So using our shiny, our shiny to create dashboards. So the company had, I don't remember how many dashboards, but several dashboards from uh, a main dashboard where the CEO, the CTO, the CFO, uh, every time they would come to the office, the first thing in the morning, they would open the computer and go to this dashboard that we created and look at the company's number, right? So they would follow every metric that they were interested through this dashboard that we created. One cool application of the dashboard was uh, they had this call center. So like, let's say, uh, uh, let's say uh, Patricia uh, calls you to the card and say, oh, I'm Patricia, um, I have the credit card and I see that there is a, a incorrect uh, charge on my card. Can you, can you take a look and see what's going on? So me as someone in the call center, I would go to my, software and I would look up Patricia and see the whole information around Patricia. That software, it was a dashboard created in R Shiny. So they were using R Shiny dashboards in the in the call center to access the customer information. I was I've never seen anything like this. That was the first time because usually when you would call you call to a call center, it's a very old fashioned software that they use, uh, very hard to understand, but that one was, it was beautiful. Um, then the third piece was creating packages. So I didn't mention yet, but we, we used R from end to end. Everything that we did was based in R. So in, 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 in a way to make our work easier, reproducible, and kind of like uh, standardized, we created our packages. So we had internal R packages. And then the last piece was to create models. Um, when we were creating models, I was pretty much almost gone, uh, moving to the next one. So that was the first company that I was working in entirely in R. So using R uh, through R Studio, using R Shiny, uh, using R Apache and data.table. I was not using um, much tidyverse, we were using data.table and that was a decision that was made uh, because of the infrastructure and, and the things that we were doing. And, and I don't know if anyone here has ever used data.table. Uh, it, takes, it takes a while to get used to the syntax, but once you understand the syntax, then it's okay, you can, you can deal with it. But I think there is a, a steep uh, learning curve 
to understand how the data dot table syntax it's been it's been several years so i don't know if it changed but like back back in the days it was a little bit different um, then in 2018 time to move on what am i going to do next okay i want to do something different <laughs> so then um there was this opportunity to work with open source and AI. I had no idea about AI. Even me, as someone that worked in tech for a while, I didn't know much about AI or anything about AI. So I was like, okay, maybe I should work for this cool thing. This everybody's talking about AI. Maybe I should go and and work it work in this field. Um, so then. I joined IBM to work with open source and AI. Uh, I have to admit that I was very scared to work for a very, very, very large corporation, right? Because my previous company, we were 35, 40. And then I was moving to a company where they have over 300,000 employees. I'm like, am I going to be bored? Am I going to be working that that very specific thing right this day by day by day, day after day after day after day i i i'm very like you know we are flexible it's sometimes like it's boring to be just oh i need to increase that hyper parameter just for a little bit um anyway so i joined ibm and as i mentioned a lot of employees i have no idea how many engineers they have in the company how many data scientists no idea and my responsibilities over there i don't even know what they were because they were a lot of different and they were not as specific as the other companies uh it was pretty much like oh you want to do this okay you can do this so we have a lot of flexibility so in my case uh let's see if i have on the next employee oh yeah in my case um i, I joined with a different title which i'm going to talk, to talk next and my team in particular the team that i was working with they were using python and docker i just put r over here because this is me uh but like everybody was using python okay so i joined as and here's the title senior open source developer deep learning machine learning artificial intelligence developer and advocate so it's this long title and i remember when i was when i joined ibm with this title people were like are you crazy you had this data science title and they and you know data scientists they make a lot of money and now you are going to do this developer advocacy thing and i'm like sure yeah why not uh it's pretty cool so look at the the, the key responsibilities it's like I'm, i'll be working with open source communities i'll be writing code i'm going to work on tools to make ai more accessible i'm going to launch new projects i'm going to work with community that's something that is i've been doing for a while especially with our ladies now uh, i'll be mentoring folks uh, you know, I'll be thinking about documentation, test, test cases, usability. So this is pretty cool. I'll be not like doing the traditional data science in terms of like creating models or analyzing data, but it's going to be a different side of, uh, of, um, of development. Uh, if, um, and it's going to be on open source. And they will also, um, they also gave me the flexibility to work on the projects that I wanted, uh, to, to keep doing the Our Ladies work as part of my job, right? So working with community as part of my job, giving talks as part of my job. So I was in this position for less than maybe six months. And then I became a manager, right? Woo, that was a big move. <laughs> uh, I don't regret. It's been two years, I guess, uh, a year and a half. I don't. Uh, uh, so I became a manager. So I have a lot of responsibilities. I'll talk a little bit about some of the responsibilities that I have as a manager. But the main difference between 
being an individual contributor, which I was before, so like someone that is not managing, so it's an individual contributor, or an IC, how we call. So I was an IC and then I became a manager. The main difference or the biggest difference was around my calendar. This is not my calendar. It's just like a example of my how my calendar looks like. So I have meetings from 7, 7.30 a.m. in the morning, pretty much all day. Um, and day after day, after day, after day. Friday, it's a little bit better. Uh, I don't have as much uh, meetings. Uh, it's, it's my time to learn or to do other things. Um, but that's the main difference. So before I had one, two, three meetings in a week, and then I was having back-to-back -back meetings every day. So by the end of the day, I'm exhausted. I like, I don't want to talk anymore. I'm done. Uh, so I manage a team of 10 open source developers. Um, so it's a mix of like data scientists, software engineers, uh, with background in statistics, math, engineering, computer science, and finance. Now uh, let's see. Okay. So let me just give some examples of the things that I do. So, and I see a, I see a question over here. If I still get to work on my own projects. Yes, I still, and I still code. I, I'm very little, but I still do. Uh, I do more like code review. I review the code that my team writes, for example. But what are some of my responsibilities? So I think about strategy. I think about uh, what is the strategy of the project that we are doing? What is the, what is the vision? What is the roadmap? Um, what about collaboration? So collaborate, collaboration uh, with other teams inside IBM because it's huge. So there are so many collaboration that we can make. Uh, think about what is next. Maybe we should shift and work in different projects. Which project should, should we uh, work on? Uh, and then, you know, the, the more important, I think the most important piece is around my team, uh, you know, uh, supporting them, giving them everything they need, need to succeed. Uh, that's the, the other thing that I mentioned. The other big difference was as an individual contributor, I was responsible for my work. As a manager, I'm responsible for them. And their success is my success. That failure is my failure as well, and vice versa. Uh, and, and you have to learn how to delegate things. I cannot do the things that I used to do on my own because I don't have time. So I, I'm, I need to be able to delegate to my team what they, um, uh, the things that they need to accomplish. Okay, so what is this organization that you work for at IBM? So the organization is called uh, CODE, which is the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. So we build tools to make AI accessible and available to everybody. Let me take another sip here. So let me give an example. On the data science workflow, we get the data, we analyze the data, we do some modeling like machine learning model or deep learning, and then you deploy the model. And then it's, let's say your model is running in production. And let me, let me explain what does it mean to be running in production? It's, I think the, the easiest way to think about this is uh, when it's live. Right, so let, let's think about uh, ride sharing, Lyft, right? So you're going to ask or to order a car and then you are in this place where a lot of people is ordering a car and then the price goes up, right? There is a model running in real time. So you, a, a team of data scientists, they deploy the model into production. So it's like model that it's running live or online instead of like offline, okay. Um, so then you have to maintain that model, right? So these are the, the, the pieces of the data science pipeline. So what we do in this, in this organization inside IBM is we create open source projects and we contribute to external open source projects. 
So Gabriela, can you give me some example of like, what is this external open source projects? It could be like, let's say our packages, right? So it's, it's an open source project that was created uh, by like, let's say a company or an individual or a foundation. So let me give you some examples. Um, so we contribute to Jupyter. So Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks is similar to what we have in R. Uh, there are notebooks or R Markdown. So it's a kind of like a, a Word document where instead of just writing text, you can write text, code, something else, or you can, you can mix and match, right? You can have words, text, you can have code, and it all runs in the same environment, like in the same document. So that's a Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook was not created by IBM, but we contribute to IBM. So we are paid, some of us are paid to contribute to open source projects that were created by other companies, other individuals, or uh, foundations. So another example is Apache Spark, uh, TensorFlow, which is by Google, PyTorch is by Facebook. Uh, we have Kubeflow, we have Pandas, which is a Python uh, package. We have Scikit-learn. So those are the projects that we contributed. We contribute, but we didn't create. Then we have projects we created, which is the data asset exchange, the model asset exchange, these packages over here that are around Trusted AI, uh, and then the Lyra. So we contribute and we advocate for open source technologies, right? So cool, let's go next. Okay, let me talk about some projects that I work on, uh, not as intensively as before, uh, in the sense of like I'm not coding as much, but I work on, this, on those projects as well. So let me talk about two main projects. Uh, one is called, the model asset exchange and the other one is called the data asset exchange. The model asset exchange on Max uh, is, is a place where you can find uh, deep learning models. And remember, in this organization, everything that we do is open source and it's free. So all the projects that we create, you can use for free. You can uh, reuse the code, you can change the code, you can do whatever you want, it's open source and it's free. So the first one, it's, a, it's more like the deep learning, the model side, this other one here, the data set exchange, is more on the data set, the data set. Uh, so it's a place where you can find useful data sets that you can use. And I'm going to touch a little bit these two projects here and you are going to understand a little uh, better. So the model as exchange, as I mentioned, is a place where you can find free and open source deep learning models. So we have 30 plus uh, open source deep learning models that we make it available. I'm not going to go into very detail, but I'm going to show you a few cool things. So uh, let's suppose, I like to give this example because sometimes it, it feels like it's something so, so distant uh, from the reality. Uh, but let me give an example. Let, let's suppose you are a data scientist and your boss, your manager, someone come to you and say, Gabriela, from now on, we are going to shift and analyze image, right? And I'm like, oh, analyze image. I was not trained to analyze an image. I only work with structured data, numbers, tables. I, I have no idea about images. Right, and then I go to the internet and I try to look for something to help me on how to analyze or how to work with images or videos, right? So then I remember, oh yeah, there is this thing by IBM, this project. Uh, maybe I could go there and try to see if they have something that I can use. Some of the, uh, some of the, the models that they make it available, maybe I can take advantage of what they have and then bring to my work. Uh, okay, so then I would come to, let me show you. This is one example, it's just like an example that I'm thinking of, like as someone that uh, have no idea about deep learning, which was my case. So I come to the page and then I'm like, okay, 
So maybe, like, let's suppose my boss, I work for this company called, okay, don't, I, I work for this company called Unsplash, where they want to have labels for the pictures. They want to add labels, and I don't know why it's not showing here. Ah, I know why. So do you see that, that they have some kind of like labels over here, right? Let's suppose my company wants you to do this. They want me to label these images, but I, it's going to be unrealistic to label these images uh, by hand. So I need to find a model that does that for me, right? So, okay, so then I come to the models exchange and I'm like, okay, let me look through this. Oh, there are some models over here. Maybe this one, image caption generator. Maybe that, that could be a good one. So I could come over here and then I'm like, okay, this is all weird stuff that I don't understand because I don't have this background. But okay, but I can understand what this model does, what kind of like architecture, uh, what kind of framework. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to learn a little bit, but I don't wanna go into details. I just wanna try something to see how this can be used on my um on my on my work so i'm going to try this web app so i come over here so if i had a lot of images which i don't know if i have because I, I was prepared to use a different one but like let's suppose i have a, several images now i'm going to submit and then it's going to generate all the labels for me all the captions for me Right, so again, I'm just looking, I saw that there is this model, maybe I could use this model, but let me go and investigate a little bit more. Oh, it's open source, I can come over here and all the code is over here. Oh, all the code is over here. So let me read a little bit more. Oh, if I wanna use this, I can because the licenses are good. So I can use all this on my company. I, I'm not going to be uh, against the law if I use this and all the code is over here so maybe i can come over here and see what oh, what they have oh it's all in python cool i can change and reuse and do whatever i want so that's one example where i don't have any deep learning model uh, or deep learning background but i can leverage what this project is giving to me another example for for another example would be i have a bunch of images and i want to have a model that is going to localize, so to find and identify what are the objects in this model. So I would go and do the same thing. So we also have a web app. This one I have pictures. I, uh, that I, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this one, traffic. Um, so I'm going to submit and then the model is running and let's see what is the output is going to give me. Okay, so this model is saying, oh, in this picture, there are some people, some person, motorcycle, their car, and there is a risk uh, probability associated with these labels. And I can play around with the probability threshold. I can see what are the labels that they found. Cool, and again, if you wanna go further, you can come over here, all the code. There are other things that I'm not going to touch on, which is, add uh, the swagger and, and other op options. But it, I'm just going to give you an example of the things that you could do. Uh, oh, I forgot to say one cool side project that I did one day was to create the same web app, which was in Python, but I created in R Shiny. So to make it also like accessible to our users. Anyway, so let's go back. Uh, Okay, so that's the model asset exchange. So let me talk a little bit about the data asset exchange, which is a project that kind of like goes together with the previous one, but this is more related to data. So let's suppose again, you are a data scientist or you are in school or you want to do a side project or you wanna understand how to analyze data. So we realize that uh, a lot of data that is available in the internet, they have licenses that are not enterprise friendly, which means that I cannot use on my company that data. I can use as a side project. I can use as a school project, but I cannot use in my company because of the license. Um, so then we created this uh, project where we have a lot of data. Uh, the majority of data come from IBM research. 
and some of the data come from 30 parties. So all are published under a friendly license. And very similar to the model as exchange, even if you go to the page, you are going to see that the page is very similar. So we try to make uh, like kind of like standard. So you, you know exactly what, what you are going to get as you go to a project uh, by our team. So let's suppose uh, I have this data set over here. So they have, again, they have an overview kind of like to talk, uh, to guide you through kind of like a summary of this data set. And then you have the metadata, right? So the type of license, what is the domain, the number of records, uh, data glossary, which I'm going to show you right now. Uh, one thing that we always think about when releasing a project is, it doesn't make sense to release a project without good documentation. So all the projects that we release, the documentation is good. And on top of that, we provide, uh, uh, we provide like an education material as well, right? So for example, this one, we are not only provide the data, but we are providing notebooks that shows you how to ingest, how to analyze the, da the data over here. Let me show you an example. So first, the metadata, you can see a preview of the data. You can have kind of like the data dictionary, what, what each column means, right? So there is a data dictionary. And then you can see the notebooks. So in this one, we have three notebooks. Again, all in Python. Uh, but it, there is one notebook that shows you how to get this data and then how to clean this data. So we, we show you uh, some commands in Python, and then we guide you through how to analyze the data, how to visualize this data. And in this case, we are using um, some kind of like time series uh, forecasting, which is over here. And we try to explain why we're doing this, right? So if we don't explain the whole theory or the whole thing, we always link to a good material. Uh, so all of the data sets come with notebooks, right? So you can come and look for a data set that you are interested in, and then they will always come with notebooks. Okay, so as I mentioned, if you wanna even go further, there is a tutorial, there is a, a learning path, right? So we always think, how can we make this project even more accessible? So uh, these are two example, examples of like a tutorials on how to get it started with these projects that I just showed you. Another cool thing, which one of my favorites, uh, the deep learning models that I was showing you there are a variety of like use cases or ways that you can consume that models in your application. So we do some uh, interesting uh, ways. So this one is we trained a model on a biology book and we created this chatbot where you ask biology questions. So you ask, what is a mitoc, I don't even know how to say, what is a cell or uh, mitochondria, I don't know. Maybe is this, this correct what I'm saying? Yeah, and then the chatbot answers. But it has to be biology because the, the model was trained using this biology book. But it's just an, an example, you know, that you can create interesting stuff. Another one, which was a, one of our interns project is a, is a web app that recognizes the yoga poses. So, yoga poses and then the web app is going to say, oh, you are doing a salute to the sun. Like, uh, another one is uh, that I have an, a video is you use your arms to make music. So there is a deep learning model running the backend and we created uh, something on top. Uh, and the idea was, is, is kind of like to imitate uh, uh, electronic instrument from 1920 called theremin. I don't know if you know about this. So you use your arms like do, 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 and you make music. So that's the one that I'm going to show you now. Let me show you just for a second.
You can try the oh, so you can try uh, go to the web page that I that I made it available on the uh, the same place where I have my slides, and you can play with it. So anyway, so that's pretty cool. I, I love this one. Okay, what else? What else I work on? So another um, set of projects that I work on which came from IBM research, uh, it's around trusted AI, right? So some ex examples. So uh, can you explain what your model is doing? So it's around explainability. So we have a package uh, which is called AIX360 that's around explainability. We have another package called AIF360 that it's around fairness. So this, this toolkit helps you on how to mitigate bias in your data set, you know, machine learning models and so on. This one, uh, Art, uh, it's a very interesting one. Uh, so let me give an example. So you use this package to kind of uh, like, uh, okay, let me, like, let me, give an example so let's suppose you have a self-driving car right so the self-driving car there are a lot of cameras and the car is looking around to see all the objects that it's surrounded so they don't go through the you know the the lights or the stop sign they need to identify everything that's around but there is an area called a diversional machine learning so there are some attacks that algorithms the way i like to describe is kind of like a virus which is not but it's just because it's easier to understand like let's suppose in your computer you have virus trying to infect your computer in the computer vision space you have some perturbations that you can cause and you can trick the algorithm so an example would be uh you have the stop sign you can pair you can disturb that image like putting a sticker on the stop sign and the and the and the and the car will not identify that as stop sign anymore it's not going to see that it's going to see that as a 20 miles per hour or uh 40 miles per hour so it's going to run through so think about all the issues that this can cause when you trick an algorithm so there is this whole area on how to protect your algorithm against those attacks Right, so that's that's the, this model over here, and then another one is the fact sheet, which is kind of like a way for you to document your whole process when you are doing data science. So kind of examples like, what is the data that you are using? Uh, what is the split that you did? Uh, what kind of models are you using? Uh, what are what are the metrics that you are using? So it's kind of like a way for you to document the whole process that you are going through, which is usually we don't document. So that's another project. So, okay. Uh, so I work uh, very closely in these projects. Uh, this one, AIF360, they were, uh, they, they, they were available only Python. And me, I, 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 I led, at, uh, uh, me and two other people, we created uh, our package. So we created our package from the Python package. So it's available now in R. Cool. All right, so I'm, I'm almost done. So what are some skills, like after talking about all this, so what are some skills that I think 
is important for a data scientist. So we all talk about technical skills, right? Which I'm not going to go into details because we all know that you should know statistics, you should know machine learning, you should know some kind of like programming, uh, you know, maybe R, maybe Python, right? But then some of the skills that I think that it's more, it's even more important in my opinion than the technical skills, which sometimes they call the soft skills, but I call the, I call uh, the essential skills, which are communication. So, you know, you need to be able to communicate what your model is giving you. You need to communicate what is the data showing you. You have to have curiosity. Keep asking why. Why am I doing this? Don't answer saying, oh, I'm doing this because my boss asked me to do. Like, ask the why. Then have some kind of like flexibility. Maybe today you are going to work on the infrastructure. Maybe tomorrow, you'll be doing data cleaning. Maybe in a month you are going to do be doing something else. Also flexibility in terms of like domains, like especially that's something that I've been thinking with the pandemic. Like if I was someone specialized in one area and their area is gone because of the pandemic, I would be lost. I would not know what to do. So. So have some kind of like flexibility. Then critical thinking, which goes together with the curiosity. Then ethics, which luckily is being talked uh, more and more, you know, about when you, when you are collecting the data, uh, see if the data is representative uh, of the whole population, see uh, if your model that you are creating is going to cause any harm to any population of sub uh, population that is underrepresented, and then the last thing, which you know, it took me years and years to finally accept, I guess, is to be yourself, right? So usually we are like, oh no, I need to change to fit in in this company, or you know, I'm working with this team uh, and I need to look like them, so I cannot be myself. But I think like we are so unique, and what do you bring? to the table, to your skills, your cultural experience, your experience in life, it's so unique to you and that's so value, so so valuable to the company, right? So be yourself and you are going to be happier. The company is going to appreciate, luckily, the company is going to appreciate all the things that you're going to bring to the table. Um, so in, in summary, like a data science is a teamwork, as I was showing before, uh, the company where I was the only person, luckily I had the data engineer, so there is always other folks w working with us. Uh, so it's a teamwork, not in terms of like only the technical, uh, you know, I get the technical uh, background or skills, but also like, you know, different skills, different backgrounds, different views, different, uh, ideas, you know, where we all support each other's uh, each other in this data science process. So, slides, materials, uh, everything that I talked about, links, it is uh, they are in this Bitly URL. If you go to this repo, try to give us a little star. Uh, don't forget about the Data Quest AI inclusive scholarship. And I know that I talked for an hour. Yes. Okay. Questions? Um, great, we really, really appreciate your talk. So, maybe Teresa, you can go through the chat. Yes, there's already a question in the chat. Um, so Patricia says, for a person that wants to venture into data science, is there any platform that shows a kind of roadmap or set of competencies that apply to data science? Yeah, so this scholarship that I was show that I that I was talking about for, for the platform DataQuest, they have like several career paths. Like if you want to become a data scientist, they have all the courses, uh, everything that you should go through to get the technical skills um, for that. So I, 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 I would recommend that one. Um, there are others, there are so many different ones. One thing, because there are so many, 
it's hard to get to go through one. So try to keep focused because that's the hardest part because you are, you are going to hear all these buzzwords and you are like, oh no, maybe I should go and learn this. Oh no, maybe I go should learn this. And then in the end, you are lost. So try to stick with one platform or one, you know, one course or one uh, book um, and, and try to go for it. For it. Oh, one thing that I wanna, wanna talk, um, interviews. I hate interviews, personally. And when you apply for data science jobs, it's very common, more common than not, that you are going to get rejected almost all the time or the majority of the time. It's very common. So don't take it personal, right? So do apply to as many companies as you can. Go through as many interviews as you can. I know that it's hard to be prepared because it's like a roller coaster, right? It's very frustra frustrated. Uh, um, and, but yeah, but that's, that's how the, the, the market is. Like sometimes the company doesn't know what they are looking for, or sometimes they are looking for a very specific profile. Uh, so I think it's a mess. I, I personally don't like interview processes. But unfortunately, the majority of the company, they, the companies, they still have a very traditional way of like interviewing. Like sometimes they ask questions uh, and I'm like, why are you asking this type of question? You don't do this on your day, uh, you know, daily work. Why are you asking this kind of question? Uh, anyway, so just, just uh, remember that it's not you, it's the company or you know, or they are looking for a very specific person. I kind of have a question follow on that uh, of uh, searching for jobs because, so you see the job and you see the post and you, you have like 10 topics, like they, uh, 10 skills, then uh, technical things and, and so on. But then I was very curious, you said like, you always, you look for um, a new thing, a different thing. So how you deal with like this, like maybe like you you don't fill up all all the requirements and because you were looking for how you do is like this contrast between the description and what you want to learn and your background and this mix <laughs> yeah so what i try to do is can i translate the skills that i have or the the projects that i did to the company that i i'm interviewing for Right, so uh, I, I I remember very clearly that uh, I had to talk about projects that I did in the past, but they were very specific to a certain domain. So domain, so I would walk them through, and, and then I would kind of like create a use case. But let's suppose in our co in your company you are trying to do this, so I could use the same model. And then, so I try to think about what are the problems, what is the uh, business case of the company, and I would try to translate what I did to that particular company. Oh yeah, and apply. Like even if you just apply, you don't don't wait to uh, to check all the boxes, right? So just apply. Uh, it, it, job descriptions are very, you know, they try to ask for the everything of course like i would do that as well right like i want to be yeah but that's not the reality so uh, just apply i would say so related to that i actually have a question and that is more just about like just out of curiosity did you feel like your kind of approach of a really non-linear career path and just kind of going in whatever direction you were interested in do you find that you have like um, peers that are also like that? Or did you feel kind of like a, that, that was your thing and other people around you were more kind of linear and traditional? Uh, it all varies. I don't think there is. Uh, and, and when I was talking as well, the, the linear path 
was even before that. Uh, it was uh, during school where, where I started one degree and then I gave up and then I went to a different one and then I took a break and then I worked with music and then I decided to do something else. And then by the time I graduated with my bachelor in statistics, I was 28, right? <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, and then I started one master and then I decided that was not my thing. And then I, so that's what I was, uh, I was referring to, but I see that, uh, you know, there's all the companies, they are using data, all the companies, they need someone to analyze the data. So you have the opportunity, you know, to try things out. So I think that's pretty cool that you have, you know, you can try and see which one you like the best, or you can just keep moving. Yeah. Looks like there's another question in the chat. Um, did you find that companies were supportive as you, uh, oh, for you spending company time learning, for example, when you had to learn a little Scala or move from R to Python, or do you need to work on those things in your own personal time? From Kathy. Okay, so I'm going to be honest. Other than IBM, all the other companies, they were not supportive of my learning because uh, I don't know if it was part of the culture or because it's so fast paced that you don't have time to learn anything. You have just to do, do and do. You don't have time to do anything else. So I would go and learn on my personal time. But at, at IBM, we do have like Fridays are supposed to be uh, the time that we have to learn. So, so they do value the learning part. Okay, so I see the other one here. So uh, in the company where you were the only data scientist, did they use R before you joined? No, they were not using. So uh, the company where I was the only data scientist, they were using Scala. Uh, the, the engineers that I was working with, they were using Scala because our servers were running in Spark. Uh, so then I, I didn't share this, but uh, I would do things like, let's say, in R, and then when I had to deploy my model into production, we would have to translate from R to Scala, which was a pain, um, but yeah, but they, <laughs> they were not using R. They had no idea where R was. Uh, and I, 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 I saw something around management. Let me see if I can find Yeah, it. it's, it's from Marta. She asked, did you get any training in management when you became a manager? Yeah, so at IBM, we have a lot of trainings, a lot of trainings. Uh, not only like videos and then uh, online learning live uh, with uh, like trainers, trainers and, and a group. Um, and then we had, I think a week, one of the trainees we had to go to IBM uh, San Jose here in California. We, uh, I stayed there for I think a week. And we had uh, trainings every day in person. So like also like going through situations like simulations uh, what are you what would you do if your employee react this way so uh, so yeah a lot of trainings and it doesn't stop <laughs> I still do uh, which which is very cool and fun that the company does that for you so they prepare me to become a manager uh, they not throw me oh now you are a manager good luck right and I think follow follow on that. Um, I'm kind of curious about this. I don't know if you um, uh, you can talk about like, but what is the benefit of the company? And when I say benefit, I mean money uh, to support open source projects. So, so to support your group, like I very like I was thinking about that, and I was like, what is the return from the company from that um, support? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Uh, 
So there are several benefits. So one is, is brand awareness, right? So people know who you are as a company. They know that you are contributing, so you care about that, right? You're working in open source. Um, the other thing is about my mind sharing. So because we are uh, like, I, I always like to give examples because I, it's the way that I, that I process things. Um, so like, let's say TensorFlow, right? So we contribute a lot to TensorFlow and then we become one of the people or the group, uh, the group that decides what is the next features that is coming in the next release, right? So if like, let's say the company needs a new feature and into TensorFlow, they'll probably take in consideration because we are contributing a lot, right? So there is the mind sharing piece as well. Um, yeah, there are others. Uh, there is no like, it's not like, it's not like, uh, the, the, the metrics are different because we are not selling. So it's like, it's not going to show a direct revenue. Uh, but yeah, but, but I can also like share that uh, IBM has been contributing to open source projects for several years since the, the Linux back in the days and several other projects as well. And I had no idea. I actually, I had no idea that companies would pay for that because all I knew was, oh, open source is something that you do in you know, a personal time. You don't get paid for that, right? Um, I think we have a Tessa question. Tessa, you can, you can say that? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I can say it out loud. Um, so for those of us without a statistics or data science background, so I have a biology background, so it's kind of a selfish question, um, but we're interested in data science careers. What, what can we do to make ourselves more prepared? So like I'm learning R and I'm trying to learn Python, but once I get past that, is there anything I can do or other biologists can do? Yeah, so again, try to think about the things that you learned and how can you translate the things that you learned into problems. So the day, even with a statistics background, the day I realized that things that they were calling in the industry, like let's say IAB test, it was nothing other than statistical tests that you do, but they were using different terminology. I was like, oh, I can't believe that that, that thing that they, all, they call this is this, right? So like, think about, uh, you know, can you translate this terminology? Can you understand uh, what that things mean? Can you try to think about what you know and how can you apply the things that you know? And I always give an example of like uh, data science teams that are, that are big. Like for example, Airbnb or even Stitch Fix. If you look to the data scientists that work for Stitch Fix, you're going to see uh, that they come from all different backgrounds. And they all have something to add, right? Um, so I don't, I, I, I'm not a believer that you have, <laughs> I'm not a believer that you have to come from a, 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 a you know, like oh, you have to come from computer scientists. You have to come from statistics background. Like I, I don't, I don't believe in that, right? Um, yeah, it, again, because data science is a team sport, so we need everybody at all different backgrounds. More questions? Maybe if there is anyone is not feeling to write, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Otherwise, I have a list of questions here. <laughs> Okay, I, I can go. So if if someone is in migrating or doing this transition from academia to industry, uh, what is your recommendation? Like, do you have any specific advice? And then um, following that is, um, should I go for a small company, a big company? Yeah, uh, so, um, you know, the, 
the, the, the, the biggest challenge that I felt when I moved from academia to industry was the pace. It's very fast paced because before, you know, we were doing this research, we would take three, six, a year to deliver something. Like we were researching and researching and reading papers where in the industry, it's very, very fast paced. You have to do something and deliver now, tomorrow, you know, in, in a few days, you don't have three months, you don't have six months, right? So that's the, that's the, the, the main thing, the, the number one, the difference. So pace. The second one is you don't have to do anything that is going to be extraordinary, right? It's like if you are doing a model, if you are creating something, it, it has to be good enough, better than what we had before. But it, it doesn't need to be like this gigantic stuff. Um, so you kind of like ch shift your mindset a little bit. Okay, I don't have time. I have to deliver. So what can I do, right? So the so that's a, another another piece. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have anything else, but those are the two main ones that I can think of. Yeah. Did I miss any? Oh yeah, you said something else. Oh, um, if you you target if you tar maybe if it. Uh, the difference in if you target a, a small or a big company. Now you have the experience in both, so. Yeah, I would say more important than that is having or being a company where you have like a mentor or someone that can work, like not being the only one, for example. I would not suggest or advise you to be the only data scientist, I think. Having a team, it's it's much easier. Uh, you have support. Uh, it's good to have someone that you can exchange idea and brainstorm. Uh, and in terms of like small or large company, it's it, I think it's more than the size. It's more around about your team. Uh, again, the support, the culture, uh, more than larger. There are pros and cons, I guess, for each one. I guess I have a bit of a question. Um, so can you just give a general, have you had like varying experiences of kind of inclusivity in the different companies that you've worked for? Are there kind of any red flags that you've noticed at interviews as far as like, maybe this might not be a good company for me to work with because of the culture, like anything like that as far as feeling comfortable in those workspaces. Is there any advice that you have for that? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so if I go to an interview and I have a, several interviews and everybody that interviews me is a guy, that's probably a red flag, right? I'm like, what is the diversity of this company? <laughs> why am I just going to, to, like, why am I just talking to you guys, right? Uh, so that's a red flag for me. Uh, another thing, which it is and it is not, it's something that I don't agree. Uh, and I have a hard time, uh, which is uh, all the, take home assignments that a company gives you, but it's so, it's so standard. It's like the majority of the companies, uh, they do that, but why I don't like that? Because, uh, so let, like, let's say you have, let's say you have, you are working, right? And then you have all these assignments that you have to do when going through a job interview, right? So then you have to take time to do the interview, the, the assignments. The, the assignments usually take hours. So you have to reserve your weekends to do the assignments. Let's suppose you have a family or you take care of someone. Like, you know, in my case, I had a, when I was doing interviews, I had a young child. I didn't have time. Like my weekends, 
were all about my child, like going to playground. So I didn't have time to do the assignments. And then I, I remember uh, talking to the company and say, you know, you talk about diversity, inclusivity, but you know that you are not going to be, you are not being in inclusive because I cannot do your assignments because I work and I have a family. I don't have time. It's not a red flag, I, I say, I, I guess, because, uh, but it's something that I, I'm, I'm, I'm against. If it's like assignment, like 20 minutes, that's one thing. But it's like eight hours, two days. That's, that's ridiculous. I think we have another very good question on, on the chat is, how did you decide when to leave a company and, and for the next company? Okay, so either I, uh, I found out that they were underpaying me <laughs> and then I asked for a raise and they were like, uh, we cannot give you a raise. And then I'm like, okay, I think it's time to move on or when there is no career path, right? I'm like, okay, I've been with the company for a while, but what is, what is next, right? Or am I going to have a team or am I going to be promoted or, right? So I, I couldn't see the next step or, or what the company was doing, it got to a point where it didn't, I was not interested on, on that, that company anymore. Yeah. Maybe let's go for the last question. Let's go guys, some questions. I still have more, <laughs> but I don't want to. I see, I see Alisa Columbus. Is Alisa from um, Arvine? You see Arvine? Oh, you should be from, I see. You see Arvine? I have a I quick know. question. Okay. Uh, if you were to give advice to your past self, what would you tell yourself? Uh, things will work out. Don't worry. <laughs> like I had no idea. Like if if I, you know, every time, I, pretty much every day, I look back and I'm like, I had no idea what the future was holding for me. Right from the very, you know, when I was uh, 15 and I missed a year, for example, I was like, okay, that's the my path is, is it going to be a failure? I'm just, I just missed a year. Um, yeah, or like I finished my degree, I was 28. So yeah, so like, don't worry, like things will come, uh, do the best you can. Uh, don't, don't push yourself too hard. <laughs> don't, don't, yeah, <laughs> take care of you, yeah. Okay, so if anyone has more questions or otherwise, we would like to thank you so, so much. We really appreciate your time. It was awesome to, to know a little bit more about you and to get to know your experiences. So thank you very much for um, being here with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, anytime, if you, if you want me to come over again to share or... I'm always up for it. Of course. Thank you. One more question. One more question. Um, did you always find a mentor where you were? No. But they asked, what is advice that you would give? That's my advice. But To yeah. find a mentor, but it was hard in those companies. Mm -hmm. So did yeah. you have mentors outside? Just like our ladies is a good place to get mentors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Well yeah. done. This uh, perfect. Uh, let me finalize with that. So one thing that I like, and I'm going to talk about IBM again, uh, 
one thing that I like about IBM is the whole culture around mentorship, right? So we not only have a platform uh, called Coach Me, where you can make yourself available to be a mentor, and you as a mentee, you can look for mentors, right? So it's awesome. It's it's from a, it's inside IBM, so you cannot it's it's uh, so it's a, it's a tool inside IBM. Um, so like, let's say I want to grow in a specific area and I don't know where to ask. I go to that platform and I see people that are, you know, that they least, they least their skills that are, you know, the ones that I'm looking to improve, I go there and, and people are very, very available. So I, 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 I think, no, I don't, it's true. It's the first company where I have mentors inside the company like the distinguishing the engineers, fellows, people that are far ahead on their career. They, uh, they have, they kind of like, they reserve some time to give mentor, mentorship. So that's awesome. Awesome. All right, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gabriela. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.